Hey guys, thanks for joining us here at New Life Bible Church, where we're all about this vision that you will never be the same. One of the best ways you can stay connected throughout your week is by turning on the notification bell, or you can hit the subscribe button, that way you're notified anytime we post a new video. You can also download our mobile app available on either the Apple Store or the Google Play Store. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the message. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord, for your Word. We believe that it does not return void, and it will make us new, Lord. We will never be the same. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about love today, and... Uh, we have a, a, a way that we use this word in the American language. So I wanted to give you a couple of, uh, of definitions. Let me give you the English Webster uh, as a noun first. A feeling of strong or constant affection for a person. Attraction that includes sexual desire. The strong affection felt by people who have a romantic relationship. A person you love in a romantic way. So the noun has a lot to do with... Uh, uh, you know, the romance and, and the sex and things like that uh, when, it, when it talks about it in the English Webster Dictionary. Uh, it's also a verb in English, the same word, love. To feel great affection for someone, to feel love for someone, to feel sexual or romantic love for someone, to like or desire something very much, to make great pleasure in something. Did you see what happened there? It went from person to person to person to something. So that's what happens in the American, in the English language. We use the word love. I love my wife. I love my motorcycle. I love hamburgers. Did we lose? Did we? I mean, it was, I mean, we just went downhill the whole time, right? <laughs> I love my children. I love my grandchildren more. <laughs> And my children know that, <laughs> right? I love you. I love my car. I love my house. I love my shoes. I'm a shoe guy. I got more shoes than my wife. So I love my shoes, <laughs> right? I love. And we use it across the board like that one word. And it loses its meaning because we use it in the American language or in the English language that way. In Greek, we have three words for love. And then we actually have four. The fourth one is a combination of, of two of them. But look at this. The first one is agape. How many of you know that word, have heard that word, right? We kind of call today a uh, celebration of agape. Um, it says, God's love, spiritual love, listen to this, you're good at my expense. I like that the best. Because God's love was reflected in the fact that he gave us our good at his expense. Didn't it cost? It cost him everything, yet it was for our good. And he expects us to love the agape love with others uh, and love our wives and love others with this way. It's always your good at my expense. It's not, it doesn't talk about a feeling. It doesn't talk about sex. It doesn't talk about romance. It doesn't talk about any of those things. It talks about God's love, spiritual love, your good at my expense. Then we have phileo. Uh, phileo, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It means brotherly love. Let me know if we're going to grow the church by one more person this morning, by the way. Uh, Nisi's due at any moment, so we could grow by one right here. So she's, ru she's there rubbing her stomach, and I'm going, oh boy. You know, if you hear a scream from that side, then we just grew by one person. Phileo, so brotherly love. This is love with no romance whatsoever. This is one where you like people that you like to hang out with. Uh, you know, I don't have I, have, I have a friend. He doesn't go to church here. He goes to Rock Church. We've been friends a long time. And he retired recently. And we both used to play golf together when he can get a day off. But now he has every day off. <laughs> so uh, I take my day off in the middle of the week. And him and I go play golf. And it's great. I don't have to minister to him. We don't talk about ministry. I'm just Rick. It's really great. If you guys ever done ministry before, sometimes it's just awesome just to be Rick and not Pastor Rick, which I love what I do, and I'm, I'm privileged and honored 
to be able to to be in the fivefold ministry because God called me to this. But uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to separate. So I have a phileo kind of love, a brotherly love with uh, this gentleman that I play uh, golf with. Now, not that I don't love you guys, but you understand this is this is a friendly kind of thing that I have. So, and then the next one is euro, where we get uh, the word erotic from. So you can tell where I'm going. A, uh, it's my good. It's my good at your expense. See how it changed? It's sensual and it's sexual. It is very greedy. It's very self-serving. This word euro. In the word love. In English, in the Webster's Dictionary, it puts all of this together. So you have brotherly love, you have love, romantic love, you have, and then in the middle of all that, you have sexual love, which is not really love at all, right? It's more of obsession. It's more of what, what, how are you going to make me feel good, right? Rather than how am I going to uh, do something for you? Then there's the, the last one. This is the one that's used the most in the Bible. You would think that agape would be. But this one is a mixture between agape and phileo, and it's called agapeo, right? And this one, if you look up love, whenever it says love, a lot of times if you look up in the Strong's Concordance, you will find that it's, it's this word, agapeo, because it's the mixture of two. God's love, spiritual love, you're good at my expense, and the brotherly love all together. This is the one that explains what you should have towards your wife. Because if you just if you just have eldo, that's not going to last. And in a marriage, it's okay to have some eldo kind of love, right? It's okay to have that, but it shouldn't be what dominates your marriage. What should dominate your marriage is everything aside from that. Okay, it's fun. God created it, and you guys know that you know I do my humana humana from up here, and I say my things and all that because we believe that God created it. It's not a nasty thing. It's not you know the devil has made it so bad that we refuse to talk about it in our churches. And if you don't learn how pure and how holy it is in church, you're going to learn how nasty and how horrible it is out there, right? So teach your kids these things that it is holy, and I can't go into all that because of time. But uh, you know that kind of love within the the context of a marriage. Is, uh, is, is very, very holy and very passionate. And it's, it's some, in some cases, it's a little self-serving. But if I could say anything to the husbands in the house, always serve her. Always. Always concern yourself for what she wants and, and always concern yourself in that direction. I can't say anything else there because then it goes into too much detail and I might offend somebody. So God's, God's love was express, expressed through Jesus. Jesus was always moved with compassion, right? A verb from the love or from love or agape or agapeo. He was always moved with compassion. Listen to this. Compassion is uh, the root word for compassion is actually agape or uh, agapeo, but it's a noun, a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune, accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. Compassionate turns the noun into a verb. I love you are just words. Your actions to show that love is completely different. Right? I love you. I love you. I love you. Well, you know, show me. Right? A lot of times the words mean something, especially the first time you say them. It's like, you know, fireworks goes off and you're like, oh. Or you go, thank you. As a, as a response, right? Because you weren't ready to say it, right? Usually the guy's like, I love you, I love you. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Go take a shower, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't know if I love you yet. So, but look at sympathy. This is completely different. But yet we operate in this one a lot. Harmony of or agreement in feeling. I feel what you feel. I'm hungry too. I see that you need something. As between persons or in the part of one person with respect to another. It's congenial. It's a, oh, a feeling without corresponding action. See, Jesus was never moved with sympathy. He was always moved with compassion. Compassion says sometimes you need discipline. Read Hebrews 12. He only loves those who he corrects. You don't like the word discipline. The word actually translates as correction or he corrects. Jesus was always moved with compassion. 
not sympathy. Look at, uh, uh, I'm going to read some things about Matthew, Matthew 9, and then we're going to read 35 through 38. In the beginning of Matthew 9, Jesus heals a paralytic and forgives his sin. He ate with tax collectors and sinners. Woman with the issue of blood receives her healing, raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. He heals two blind men, and then we get to uh, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. That should be coming up. There we go. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every... Everybody say every. every. Not those who he chose, not those who he, I will, this one, or... No, he chose what? Every. Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The people were coming to him in faith to receive, and everyone did. But when he saw the multitudes... Listen... He was moved with, com- moved. that's an action, right? He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. He didn't say pray for the harvest. He said they need shepherds. There's another one where it says, Jesus saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion and he went up to the mountain to pray. I'm like, he was moved with compassion, didn't do anything. He went up to pray and he took his four with him, his special, the closest. You know, he had his four, he had his 12, he had his 72, and he had his 300. And those that were closest to him were those four. And he took them up to the mountain to pray. What He was preparing them to do what he was doing. Because he knew that by himself, he was no way he was going to be able to minister to this multitude of people. But if he discipled others and trained others to operate in the same power and in the same love or compassion that he was operating in, then he could reach a lot more people. And that is still happening today. We win them, consolidate them, disciple them, and we send them out to do the same. Right? That's our vision here. We want to win the loss. We want to show them and get them free from all their past. And their, you know, we want them to be free. Don't you want to be free? I don't want to bring my baggage from my old life into my new life. So that requires some discipleship to be freed from all that. And then we train them to go and preach the gospel and do the same thing. For we all have the ministry of reconciliation, it says in Corinthians. We all have it. So we all have a responsibility to go out and reconcile the loss to God. It's, it's our responsibility. Now, you may not have the words. You may not be eloquent about it. And that's fine. Some people don't need that. Some people just need to know that you got saved and how you got saved. They don't need scripture. The Bible says the world doesn't want to hear that anymore. They want to see God in operation in you. They want to see him working in you. Amen. Amen. These, there's ingredients that work together with love, and one of them is faith. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or freedom by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That, that's happened to some of us, hasn't it? You get free, and then you end up falling or tripping or getting, you know, that's okay. Get unbound and get up again, and let's keep going right? God's not concerned with that. He's only concerned with with the end product, okay? What happens in the middle, he he understands. He's not going to leave you there. He doesn't understand enough to tell you you can keep doing that. He understands enough to tell you, get up, let's keep going. And that's why it says he'll he'll forgive you as many times as he needs to forgive you to make sure that you move forward. Verse 2, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become uh, circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. This was a big deal. The Jews were like, what? This was their main, you know, way of, of, of getting people to become members of the church. The Jews get, until today, they get circumcised. Imagine coming to the church, I want to become a member. And the, and the, and the priest pulls out a knife. <laughs> that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who, co- who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. No one did. That's why we needed Jesus. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. (laughs) Man, I could preach there. 
For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ, Jesus neither, circ- uh, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But listen, he says that doesn't count. This is what counts. Faith working through what? Love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This, per- this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It just takes a little bit. And I could, I could sit there for a little bit too, but we're going to go with faith working through love. How is that, that faith works through love? See, because anything that you believe in in faith, as long as it's operating in love, very few times does it have to do with what you need. My wife and I sometimes go months and we look at each other and says, you know, our prayer time is always for you. Our prayer time is always for the church. Our prayer time is always for what you guys need, for this person going through that. And that person, we pray specifically. We pray for the church, and we pray for the church as a whole, not just us, but we're just part of the body. The body is all the churches that are meeting this morning. We're not any, we're just part of the body. So we pray for you, and, and we pray for our children, and we pray for our grandchildren, and we pray for our family, and you know, my wife's family in another country, and we pray for this, and we pray for that, and then we realize we never pray for ourselves because our faith works through love. doesn't mean that you can't pray for yourself. There are needs and wants. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's not a prosperity gospel. So don't, get, don't misunderstand me, because we don't preach that here. We believe that prosperity is simply being pushed forward. If you're better than you were yesterday, then you've prospered. That's what it means. So if you get, an, if you, get a, a, you know, if it meant that we were all supposed to become millionaires and, and you know, drive around in, in $2 million cars and live in, you know, huge mansions, then, then we'd all be there, right? Don't we, some of us at least have some faith for that? There's nothing wrong with that. But is that going to make me a better minister, a better preacher? Is that, in my case, it would probably hurt. Those of you are going, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if you were driving, you know, a Bentley and, and living in a huge house, right? God takes care of us, and it's not always through the church. We live by faith. You should try it. <laughs> it's really awesome, man, living by faith. Because I live by what he provides. Amen? The same with the church here. We don't live by your giving. You give for you. You give because it's good for you. And we live by what he provides for us to continue doing what he's called us to do. All right, I'll keep going. Now, there he goes again, talking about money. Faith works through love. If faith works by love, then we need to take a closer look at faith and love and find the connection. So faith is, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If we keep reading through what we call the faith chapter in, in Hebrews 11, we see that the great men of God living their lives by faith, and all they did was rooted and grounded in their love for God and for God's people. Read through there. You got, you, you got Moses, you got Noah, you got, you know, you go through there and, and, and so-and-so did this and so-and-so did this by faith and so-and-so did this. And it's always about someone else. I mean, he, Noah spent all that time, uh, you know, building that ark. 120 years. It hadn't even rained. And he's thinking, on dry land, he's building a boat. And they made fun of him and made fun of him and made fun of him. And what did he do? He saved. That boat became the salvation of his family and those around him. Why? Because he loved. Yeah, he had a little bit of a drinking problem, but he loved. (laughs) Read your Bibles, man. If you see the people that God used, everyone, that's right, man. Makes me feel comfortable up here, actually, when I read some of this stuff. I'm not so bad. Faith is the hand that receives things we need from God. Everything Jesus purchased for us on Calvary can be obtained by faith. This includes our salvation, our healing. We believe in healing around here. The fullness of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, victory over the world, the flesh, the devil, and all the powers of darkness. All of these things come to us by faith, but it must be faith 
that works through love. So faith is the vehicle that drives us, right, to receive from God what he has promised us. His word, then love is it promised us in his word, and then love is the gas that makes that faith run, right? We say, we always say hope is what gives faith a target. So we have our hope, but we're never going to get what we hope for. We're going to get what we have faith for. So our hope is our target, our faith, right? How do you get to that target? With the, 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 the gas that goes in the vehicle of faith that causes me to move forward, right? As long as you're asking in love, now, if, oh, gimme, give gimme, give my name is Jimmy. You know, if those are your prayers, <laughs> you know, if I lay my hands on this $100,000 Mercedes and, you know, I make 12 bucks an hour, but it, God says, no, that's not true. That's not love, is it? You might love that Mercedes, <laughs> right? But it's not the, the agape or agapeo kind of love. Amen? You guys see that? Uh, let's move on. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins or covers all sins. What does that mean? That we put up with sin? No. No. We look beyond that. That's all that means. It covers it so we don't see it. Jesus, by his blood, removes it. See, the law in the Old Testament, that's all it did. It refrigerated our flesh. The New Testament kills the flesh. See, it didn't allow us to rot because we were covering it up and we were refrigerating it and trying to keep it going until the coming of Jesus. And then what did we do? We killed the flesh. It's gone. Now I live in this flesh, but this flesh doesn't serve God. My spirit serves God, and I serve him with everything I have. Even though I may trip up every once in a while, I may do this and that. But listen, I am holy because he is holy, and he has made me holy, and he forgives me of my sin, and I am no longer that guy. I buried the old Rick. He's gone. That flesh that we refrigerated through the law is buried underground. I can't, if, if I wanted to live that life again, I'd have to dig him up, and he stinks. Literally and figuratively, he stinks, right? I don't want that guy again. If you saw me before, man, okay. I don't even remember what I used to be. 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent love, not just love, but fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. So if you were put... These two scriptures together that I just read, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little liberty here and, and, uh, and paraphrase them two together. Love covers all sins even when there's a multitude of them. Covers all sins even when there's a multitude of them. If you're looking at your spouse or looking at your brother and sister or you're looking at your sons, your daughters, uh, uh, sin and you're trying to tell them that they're sinning, that ain't going to work. If you look beyond that, see, Jesus... Okay, I got five minutes. Who give me five minutes? Look, you guys always do that. Five, 10, 15, 20. How do you guys never get that? You guys never get that. I, I had new people here. I thought they were going to... She did raise her hand, but I was like, how did I not get that? If, got 20 more. <laughs> <laughs> now I forgot where I was. Uh, but the, it, love covers all sins, even when there's a multitude of, of them. God loves, love, God's love covers our sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I forgot what I was going to say, and then you guys. Comes from the root of the word. The, the word covered, listen, comes from the root word klepto. Which means to steal and to hide. His love kleptos the sin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and he hides it. Never to be seen again. As far as the east is from the west, it says. In the deep ocean, where it never can be recovered again. He kleptos our sin. Who are we? To point out the sin in another when God, who is holy, doesn't. Yes. Now I remember. Jesus, <laughs> he would approach people in need. The blind man, the crippled man. Not once did he say, your sin 
You have to repent of this before I... You have to... He ne- and we do that. There are religions and there are doctrines that do that. Where did we get that from when Jesus, who is God on earth, never did that? He gave them what they needed. He didn't ask them if they were saved, if they knew God, if they were atheists, if they nothing. He just did it. Why? Because the signs and wonders preceded the gospel. Before. It went before. You didn't preach the gospel. You know, I was part of a homeless ministry, and I really enjoyed being part of this particular ministry. It was overseen by the Methodists, and I was the director of operations over there. And we, we, one of the things that we refused to do and that I agreed with was we never made the homeless come and sit in a sermon or sit in a prayer service or something before we fed them or gave them what they needed. We gave them what they needed, and most of them left because that's what the Bible says. If you see one who needs clothing, give him clothing. If you see one who's hungry, give him food. It doesn't say if he's strong enough to work, don't help him. If he shouldn't, you know, why is he hanging out in the corner? If he's spending it on beer, don't help him. It didn't say that. It said give it to them if they have a need. It almost sounds like it's more for us than it is for the one in need. Think about that for a minute. It's almost more like like for us to be humbled than, than the one in need, even though we're providing something for the one in need. And we never did that. And some would stick around. We would say, hey, we're going to have a little thing. We're going to share a little bit of the Bible. If you guys want to stick around, we're going to pray for you. If you have prayer needs or anything like that. And, and some would, a few of them would stick around. And we would, we would pray with them and help them. But we never, Jesus never did that. He would go up. One time he went to the blind man and the disciples said, why are you, you know, what did his parents do? What sin did they commit that he was born blind? And Jesus says, no. This is why he was born blind. See. And the man saw. I was blind, but now I see. Who gets the glory? Why? Would, so God would get the glory. That's why that happened. Not because of sin. Why do we connect those two things? Teaching me something. Oof. That, that, oof, it gives me chills, that doctrine. You guys gave me five more minutes, so it's about 20. But we had a gentleman, and I won't tell you the church or, or the name of the pastor or anything. That church really blessed us. It was, it was God sent that we went there. And we spent about three years there before I went to, uh, to Rhema uh, Bible College. But I went, uh, we were part of this church, and there was this gentleman there. And uh, his, it, we were praying for his wife. His wife had cancer, and, and she wasn't doing well. And we went to pray for her. And uh, I prayed the prayer of faith over her. And I believed for healing, and I believed that God was going to remove this cancer from her body. And I rebuked, I spoke to the cancer. That's what we believe here, too. We, can, we have the power to speak to things, you know, say unto this mountain, be thy removed. And, right? So we spoke to the, and I prayed over her and, and the prayer of faith. And after we were done, the man looked at me and he said, well, you know, I hope that God heals her, but uh, he may be teaching her something. And thank God for the Holy Spirit, right? Because it came all over me. I'm telling you, it came all over me. I said, so what are you doing? Is she going to a doctor? She says, oh, yeah. Is she in chemotherapy? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I said, listen, I don't mean to offend you, but if what you believe is that God's teaching or something, then why are you taking her for treatment? He was not happy with me. And a few days later, he said, Thank you. I'm praying over my wife in faith now. I'm praying that God is going to heal her because by the stripes of Jesus, she is already healed. Now, she went through her treatment and she had an operation and she made it. But they told her she wasn't going to make it. They'll do everything they can. And I said, I told them, this has always been my wife and I. We do everything we can. Your children are not your faith experiment. You do everything you can in the natural to help them. We have that ability to do that. Thank God we live in this country, right? We have the science and the medicines and things to do that. So we did everything we could, and I won't give you that testimony, but we did everything we could for our kids. And when the la- for one of our children, and it was not a good report, and the, the last doctor, specialist, told us, there's nothing else we can do. And I smiled. Again, Holy Spirit, right? I smiled, and he looked at me, and he says, did you not hear what I said? I said, yeah said, now God takes over. 
I said, we have done everything we can. My faith went from, from halfway, you know, because I was having faith, but we were doing the treatment. So your faith kind of moves towards the treatment, right? But when there was nothing else we could do, all of a sudden my faith had nowhere else to go. Come on, right? And, she, and my daughter, our daughter, was completely healed of something that should have taken her life. The same with this woman, right? Faith worketh through love, and it covers a multitude of sin. Don't ever look upon somebody, look at them through their sin, because you'll never see what God sees. See, why did Jesus have to die on a cross and shed his blood for the remission of our sins? So God can have a relationship with us, because we are not holy. We, we are not. We sin. We fall short. All have fallen short. Right? We have all fallen short. So God, being holy, cannot look upon that. But now through Jesus, he can have a relationship with us. He can have, and we have a person. We could go into his throne room boldly, as it says. Why? Because of what we've done? No, because of what Jesus did. We need to remove that unworthiness. You know, unworthiness is, is a, 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 an enemy of your faith. Think about it. You go to God and you ask for God for something and you're praying for healing or you're praying for a breakthrough in your job or your relationships or something like that. And you go to God and then you think, then the, what does the enemy do? Because it's not God. The enemy reminds you of your sin. Right in the midst of your faith. He comes and reminds you of your past. God doesn't do that. That's the devil. He's reminding you of stuff from your past and he's making you feel unworthy, which what? Shocks your faith and it doesn't allow him, causes doubt to come in and now your faith does not work. Because you feel unworthy. But God's love is not like that. <laughs> it covers, right, a multitude of sin. Hallelujah. I'm going to send you to read this. I'm not going to read it. Uh, you can't talk about love without going to 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, you guys can read that at home, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, verses 1 through 13, it talks about the different. I have another teaching that goes through each one of those. You know, uh, uh, love is not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not, right? It, it looks at other people's needs before its own. And it goes through all those things there. So you guys can read that at home. It's pretty self-explanatory. But we need, to, we need to learn to love each other. The Bible also says that they will know that we are Jesus' disciples if we love each other. It's pretty easy when you're in a church like this and, you know, and you love each other. Because we have the same beliefs and, we, you know, the preacher, I, believe, I, I agree with what the preacher's saying and, and they, they minister to us and, you know, we're a family church. So we have, you know, uh, we have ministries for the kids and we have life groups that you can go to and, and get ministry from your life groups. And you have all these things that you can, that, that, you know, we're part of. And other churches may have more. I know there's churches that have more programs and more activities than we could ever have here. And. You know, and, and there are churches out there for that, too. We need to learn to love the other churches and the other people, even if they believe differently than we do. So if you disagree, this, is, this has been the big thing nowadays, right, in the world. It's okay to disagree with somebody. It's not okay not to love them because you disagree. I had people that I, that I met with and spoke to on a regular basis that were atheists. Now, they said that because they didn't want me to preach to them. <laughs> they didn't even know what atheism was because I asked them, I said, so what's your belief system? No, you didn't understand. I don't believe. No, not believing in God is a belief system. Tell me about your belief system. I want to understand. And they didn't have an answer. Now, there are other atheists that have answered that question for me, and I understand why they say that. And if I'm understanding, it might open the door for them to ask me something. And that has happened too. And I've had people become... I wouldn't say friends, but acquaintances that I could talk to and have lunch with and have a cup of coffee with and talk about anything, football and golf or whatever, anything else, guns and shooting, whatever. We can talk about things that have nothing to do with God, and you create that relationship. So you know, I mean, I could, Jesus is my example. I don't know about you, but if I'm your example, then you missed it, okay? <laughs> Jesus should be your example, right? I serve you as I serve him. That's what Paul said. I'm serving you as I serve him. All right, so I serve him, and because I serve him, I'm, I'm able to serve you. So he should be our, our example. Jesus went, he, <laughs> Jesus was crucified. One of the reasons he was crucified was because he would go to people, tax collectors, sinners, bibbers, right, people who drank. He would go to their home and eat with them. 
without even telling them that they were in sin or they, they, you know, they had to do any. They, he didn't do any of that. He just went and created relationships. Yeah. See, your relationship with God is very personal. It is very personal. I'll end with this and then we'll pray. I was, um, there was a, a friend of ours and, and he had several tattoos. I don't, I don't have any, but I don't have a comment for or against or anything like that. I just don't. I actually, if you go to our website, there, there, is that one still posted on there? Uh, it's, I think it's called, it's an old, old video. So it, may, it ain't going to be as good quality because Gus didn't do it, but it's an old, old video. And um, uh, it's me. I think it's called, is God really concerned with my tattoo? Oh, Ricky shared that one. That's right. So, uh, Ricky shared that one. So it's Ricky talking. Look at him looking at me. Go online, bro. You see yourself. He, he made it a little more fun because, you know, I just sit at my desk and he pops in and he's got a Gatorade in his hand, his hat turned backwards. And so I remember it now. I, I forgot that it wasn't me that time. I did teach it. And then he looked and said, no, nah, let me do it. I said, okay. So I gave him my notes and he did it. Ricky's my son, by the way. So, uh, so yeah, it's on there and it gives you a couple of scriptures. And um, anyway, so you'll see what, what, it's not really what we believe. It's just what we see. How's that? Okay. So I'm at this tattoo parlor. I'm not getting a tattoo. My friend is. He, he got a big tattoo on his arm that said born to lose. So now he's saved. He's a Christian and he's, you know, and he's living his life for the Lord and, and he wanted to get rid of it. So he was going to get a big sun. I forget what they call it. Sun something. It's to, to cover it up. So I said, I'll go with you. So we went and we sat there. And this guy was very outspoken with the gospel and talked to anybody that he could. And so he sat on the, on the chair and, in, in, you know, the, the, ta the tattoo artist came over. And uh, you can imagine what he looked, anything that you could imagine a tattoo artist looked like, this guy had it. <laughs> so he came over and he sat down, barely said anything. He said, this is what you want. He put the stencil on his arm. He said, okay, you ready? He asked, yeah, you okay? He always asks, you know, because it's going to hurt or whatever. So, okay, and then he starts going. <sighs> so he's sitting there, and man, like three, three minutes go by. It felt like an hour. No one says a word. So I'm just sitting there, you know, and I'm looking or whatever. And the first thing that my friend in the chair says to him says, so how's your relationship with God? <laughs> so I'm thinking, this guy's like, He's doing this. He could, he could do, you know, he could do whatever he wants at this point. He marked this guy up pretty bad, you know. I'm thinking, I wouldn't have asked that, man. I would have let him finish, you know. <laughs> so the guy pulls, it, you know, and he pulls back and he goes, that's personal to me. And it's none of your business, right? Wow. And he looked at him and he leaned forward and, and started going again. And, and my friend looked at me and looked back at him. And so I started looking at the guy's tattoos because it, it represents something that either he believes or he, you know, you don't just do that, right? So I was like, what, what is that one on your shoulder there? And then I don't remember what it was. And he would explain it to me. And then, oh, what, what's that one over there? And then he had shorts on. He had one on his calf that was pretty cool. And I was like, wow. You know, and then he had, uh, I think he was a Detroit Lions fan. <laughs> and he had one on the, on the back here of the Detroit Lions, Lions logo and a little football underneath it or, or whatever. I said, are you from Michigan? He goes, yeah, I was born and raised there. I'm a Lions fan. I said, okay. So now there's a conversation going on. My friend's sitting in the chair is going, what just happened? You know, <laughs> this guy just cussed me out, and now you're talking to him, you know? And then, and then I go, what happens if the Detroit Lions go to another city? And then he answered in his fluorescent wordings that he used. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so we kept talking. So by the end... Uh, he was done. It took a while, and he got up, and, and I shook the guy's hand. I said, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And he goes, looking at me, he goes, what are you guys, Christians? And I said, yeah, I am, but, you know, it doesn't make me better than you. It just makes me better than me. And he went, what? <laughs> and I said, yeah, me being a Christian doesn't make me better than you. It only makes me better than me. He goes, explain that to me. <laughs> My buddy is sitting there going, what is going on? I just tried, you know, this guy should be crying and giving himself to Jesus after I asked him about his relationship with God. You know, what did you just do? So I told him and he didn't give me an opportunity. So I left, but I planted a seed in that guy's heart. Who knows who's the next person sitting in that chair, right? You never know. But I approached him in love. I didn't judge him for his tattoos. 
I didn't judge him for his sin and his language and what he smelt like. I know what he was doing out back. If it were me getting the tattoo, I would say, you're going to need to wait. Get a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not, you're not sticking me with that thing, right? But the Lord has ministered to me because of where I came from. And he loved me right where I was. And if you saw the dark hole pit that I was in when God reached out for me, you would think there's no hope for that kid. I was 19 years old, June 27, June 21st, 1987. And the pastor kept telling me, God loves you just like you are. I said, you have no idea who I am. I just as much pull this knife out of my pocket and stick you with it and walk away. That was just me talking. I could never hurt anybody, even back then. I was trying to scare him off, and he wouldn't. He kept telling me the same thing, and then they, they sat me. There was a movie on a TV, and I was obligated to go to this retreat, and it was The Cross and the Switchblade. Anybody ever heard of that? Nikki Cruz. And I, I sat there and watched that video, and I watched David Wilkerson tell Nikki Cruz that he loved him. He goes, you could cut me up into a million bite-sized pieces, and every piece would love you just the same. I, cu I, couldn't, I couldn't get that. I didn't understand that. I was like, what? I said, okay, God, if this is true, in my fluorescent language, <laughs> if this is true, then you love me too. And I went and I found that pastor, Pastor David Southwell in Miami. I found him and I said, I believe you. What do I got to do? With an attitude. I wasn't like broken down yet. <laughs> I put my eyebrows together and, you know, I had one fist balled up back here just in case. And I said, I want that. We stepped outside and I got saved, radically saved. Got baptized in the Holy Ghost and never looked back. I buried that guy in Homestead, Florida. He's buried somewhere out there. <laughs> and I ain't going to go look for him either. Why? Because God, I understood God's love. It went past all the stuff I had done. It went past all my sin. It went past all. And, and listen, this is not just your relationship with God. It's your relationship with people, your spouse. We're so easy to point out what our spouse is doing wrong and what makes us mad and what this. and what, If we were to look at them like God looks at them, I call it a heavenly perspective. If we were to look at them from up there and see how God sees them, you would fall in love all over again. <laughs> Amen? God's love is powerful. And it lives inside of you, making it possible to love anybody. Amen? Not like your hamburger, but agape. Now we're all going to go out and get hamburgers, right? Red Robin. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the message. Please make sure to subscribe, download the app, and you'll have access to many messages that I'm sure will bless you. And as always... You will never be the same.